Hi, welcome to Blogging, a practical introduction. My name is Liz Ayling and I run several blogs actually and I've been blogging since about 2002. So over the years I've run probably about five or six blogs. Um, some are personal and some are for companies. So Alex has asked me to come along. I was going to deliver this lecture live, but as it's Easter and I have to go away, and Alex has to go away, uh, we decided it might be best to do it as a recording for you so you can dip back into it whenever you want and uh, watch it under your duvet and uh, relax over it rather than having to struggle into the lecture hall. Anyway, um, as a long-time blogger, um, trained journalist, um, I've been involved in communications um, for as long as I can remember, the good, good 30 years for the European Commission and most of the large corporate entities here in Malta as well, the tourism board um, and all sorts of things like that. So what Alex decided was, as somebody who's actually in the trenches blogging pretty much on a, what well, I used to be a daily basis, but now it's pretty much a weekly basis because things have changed since um, I started blogging. When well, it was very important to try and get that content out there on literally a daily basis. Things have rejigged, um, which is a much happier place to be because it is quite stressful trying to run a blog. And I'll go through some of the, the tasks you have to do and some of the abilities you have to, to be able to do it. Now, usually if I run this lecture live, um, I ask for a show of hands about how many people have actually run a blog. And <clears throat> usually it's very, very few, just one or two or perhaps no one. Or people mistake other things as actually blogging, like sort of posting on Facebook regularly or tweeting and things like that. So during the course of this practical introduction, I'm going to look more at the tools that you're going to need to be able to blog, the kind of platforms that you can be on, um, sort of content management, how to organize yourself, strategy behind blogging. We'll dip a little bit into things like SEO and Google Analytics although those would be entire subjects and uh, lectures in their own right. So really this is literally what it says, a practical introduction. So if you're blogging already, um, I hope you'll still get something out of it. And if you're new to blogging, I actually hope it will inspire you to, to start a blog, a personal blog, even, you know, outside of your university time and not feel you have to do it just for the purposes of a course or getting some marks or fulfilling an assignment, but that you can actually enjoy um, starting a blog on a, on a hobby or passion and um, and I think that's a good route to entry. Anyway, let's get going with the with the actual slide deck. Okay, so the first thing is, I think, a, a question to ask is what exactly is a blog? Um, now this might seem a pretty simple answer, but there's uh, quite a lot of grey area actually about what a blog is. Now if you, if you do the simple thing and just Google a definition, you'll come up with <clears throat> absolutely millions of possible answers to this. Now, blog is actually a short form of what was originally web log, web diary in other words. So it's it basically started, probably the first blogs came out in sort of the early 90s, um, by about the mid to late 90s there were people who were sort of calling themselves bloggers um, and beginning to actually sort of um, promote themselves via blogs either personally or their businesses. So by about 2000 when I sort of dipped my toes into blogging it had already become very established. But the very early blogs were, were generally um, people's personal diaries. So that's, that's where the term came from. So what exactly is the act of blogging? Well, really what it means is it's, it's the um, sitting down um, with a blank sheet of paper, only it's on screen, and writing a post. Now, whenever I've talked about blogging before, or I've um, trained people whose websites I've done, and I've handed over the website, the, the, the blog come website to them, they very often get muddled up between a page and a post. Now, post is actually the diary part of the site and the page would be um, things like the about page or sort of um, you know, the contact page. So they're not running in a diary sense, they're just static pages on the website, whereas the blog will be more dynamic and it will run in reverse chronological order. So, yeah, so basically a blog is those entries in reverse chronological order. It means... Um, not everybody does this, but it should mean frequently updated. There should be a reg, you know, you should be posting regularly. It shouldn't be something that languishes for about a year. I mean, if you think about the pages on a site, the contact and about page, very often nobody does anything to those for years. If you go into corporate sites, like I do quite often, nothing has changed for about 10 years, when it, when it should have done, actually. But the post is, is by default meant to be, the blog post is by default meant to be an updated thing. So you're frequently posting. As I said, it used to be every day, which was completely killing. And now you can post uh, less frequently, but, 
but leave those posts on social media, which we'll look at later. Blogs also run um, areas for comments. And again, um, you can have the comments switched on or the comments switched off if you're the administrator of a blog. So it's really up to you whether you do that. But in theory, there is an area for comments. And some blogs um, don't get any comments <laughs> and others get a lot. And we'll look at why that's the reason a bit later on too. Blogs can be individuals, generally the ones I run, um, I run by myself, although more to Inside Out, which is one of the blogs that I run, um, we actually had at one point, I think about 80 different contributors to the blog. Um, people who dipped in with one blog post, perhaps on a specific thing or an event, and other, others who are more regular um, contributors. So I could assign them um, greater administrative rights on the back end so they could go in and post their own blog without me having to upload it for them. So it can be multi-authorship or individuals. And the one thing blogs always have is um, they have an archive of those posts so you can drill down. And if you've been on blogs or you've been researching some, Googling something and you've come up with a, a blog post on that topic, you'll find that it will have categories on the side so you can look up more related to, let's say, it's a specific technical area of, um, of, of web or the web or something like that or fluffy cats you know my cats here what do i do and you you find a, a, a blog about cats and on the category area they'll have different things like health and welfare and what to do at the vets and you know how to prepare your cat for you going on holiday there are various categories down the side so the posts will be archived in various ways with tags and categories and by date Okay, so moving on, um, let's look at the, the sort of uh, nuts and bolts that go into a, a blog, blog post. Well, as we all know, you can embed these days absolutely anything. It can be text, images, audio, visual, um, any of those combinations can go into a single blog post. Some people who run their blogs on Tumblr can be very visual and they don't really like writing too much in the way of text. So many Tumblr blogs I tend to find are very much run by photographers, they just want to put up the, the images and receive comments on those. And if you're using other platforms, which we'll look at the platforms later, platforms like Medium, Medium tends to be much more a, a sort of writer's um, platform with, with much more text heavy blog posts and fewer pictures. So basically you can use any of those. Um, another aspect of a blog um, or site really, because we look at the actual platforms and, and why site and blog are kind of almost the one and the same thing, is that these days really all of them should be responsive to use on different mobile um, different mobile platforms. So it can be a visible, it will reduce and it will render in a legible way, whether you're looking at it on the smallest um, mobile phone or laptop or desktop or tablet. So if you're not mobile responsive, if your site or blog um, is not mobile responsive, you will probably find that you'll be downgraded by Google in its search. So there are various reasons why you need to be retina ready or mobile responsive, as they call it. Um, now, when I first started out in about year 2000, when I was doing my master's in digital, digital media, um, we actually had to learn the nuts and bolts of the coding to go in to build up a blog. Or a website. So I actually learned the HTML, I learned the CSS which does the styling on the page and the HTML will be what renders it where a block goes to the left, goes to the right, or, you know the positioning of things on a page and had to understand how to put those nuts and bolts together and how to use file transfer protocol to upload it to a host and, and uh, you know publish your blog. So I actually had to learn in the trenches on the actual coding side, but life has got a lot more easy these days. And there are all sorts of platforms which uh, come under the heading of content management systems, CMSs, uh, the WordPresses of this world, Squarespace and Azilia and others, which means you can just concentrate on the content. So these are happy days. You can just look at the content and you don't have to be worried too much about the technology under the bonnet like I was when I first started out. Um, blogs can of course be read in various formats, some people still use RSS to email um, and uh, I don't tend to do that if I put a blog post up I actually try and build up my email email database, my email list and I will send out um, an email for something like MailChimp saying yes there may be a new blog, blog post up on the blog but I won't get it automated because I think that is a bit less personal but some people use feeds like that to receive blog posts. So it can be received in all sorts of ways as well. Um, so that's a little bit of the technology. Now on to the tone of blogs. Well, by default, if you're blogging, it's a lot more personal than, um, you know, you have to put your heart into it a little bit. So usually, whether it's a technical thing 
or it's you know my fluffy cat blog people are you know as individuals blogging they will tend to put more of their personality into it they will have an opinion they will have a voice there will be um, a lot more sort of touchy feelingness going into it and people respond to that I mean these are the days of social media so we we expect to know the founder behind something we, we are very curious beings and we'd like to know more so blogs do tend to be uh, more personal and this becomes an issue if you're running um, a company blog um, exactly how do you balance between a personal tone and and the sort of putting the face of the company out there as a company you can do business with there are people people like to do business with people so ultimately even if it's a corporate blog um, and the ones I've run I've tried to put it in a slightly more informal tone um, less salesy because many company blogs you go on to they're just kind of promoting the products the whole time dishing out the products we've got this new product we've got this new product and they're not really delivering the information in the blog in the way that can the customers like to read a blog post on something they don't mind reading the sales brochure but when it comes to the blog post they'd like to know a little bit more from the people behind the company so it's a bit of a gray area on corporate blogs but I do think most companies would fare better if their blogs um, were run on a more personal basis I mean you know not not totally what goes on behind the scenes but you know interviews with people for instance the ones I've done locally I've interviewed some of the staff from you know people doing on this, this the sales side up to the CEOs and it just gives a more human face to the companies so you know that's that's the kind of angle and tone that corporate blogs will take um, visitors can subscribe and comment we've mentioned before those can be switched off um, how does blogging actually different from things like microblogging, Twitter and Periscope and even Anchor FM, which some of you might have come across? Well, you know, those have a limited number of characters. It's up to 280 now with Twitter um, and Twitter is often called microblogging, but it's not the same as actually having to craft a blog post and stick it up. That is a considerable, um, takes considerably more time um, and more effort to craft in, in, a, in a sort of constructive way. Whereas Twitter, Periscope, Anchor are very much more off the cuff, a bit like we post on Facebook, more off the cuff comments and we can respond very quickly. Um, I'm not saying we don't put thought into when we put things on Facebook, but a blog post is ultimately a little bit like writing a mini essay every time you write a blog post. So that's why I think a lot of people get put off blogging because they feel it's more onerous to do. Okay, so is a blog social media? Um, well, a blog is, yeah, it can be and it, it isn't. I mean, this is a question I usually throw out in the live, um, the live lectures and I get a, a kind of mixed show of hands on, mm, yes, maybe, we don't know. And you're probably right if you're sitting on the fence about this one. Um, a blog in a way can be totally broadcast media. If you switch off those comments and you're not really interacting um, and you're just feeding stuff out, which you may want to, for instance, the corporate blog that I do for a company locally, we, we, we don't have comments in, um, enabled on that. It just goes out as a kind of broadcast medium. If you're enabling comments and you're engaging with people, then it is more of a sort of social, on the, on the sort of social media side of things. And if your blog is merely your home, but you're engaging on your social media that feed back into your blog via Facebook about a post you've just posted or on Twitter, or even on, you know, Pinterest takes some comments, although it's less sort of social than people think. Um, you could say that the blog is social media as well. So just to sum up this first section, um, what exactly is a blog? Well, that headline says it all, really. It can be all and it can be nothing. And I always like this, um, this quote. A blog is merely a tool that lets you do anything from change the world to sharing your shopping list. And um, it, it really can be that. I mean, people will do inane things on their blogs and other people will be political bloggers. They will be in jail for it. In theory, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a hugely active activist political tool, or they might be just sharing their latest holiday diary with their friends and family back home and keeping things private. So you can do all or nothing with it. But I think the interesting thing about blogging is and this is what really excited me and, and still does today, you know, back in 2000. For the first time ever, because I trained in traditional journalism and there's always a gatekeeper, you know, there's always that editor and things have to go through the copy, the, the proofreaders and the editor. And by the time your article gets out, you know, it's been through a whole pile of people and probably even change. Whereas with a blog, you can put it up directly yourself. You know, there is no gatekeeper but yourself. 
So the beauty of a blog is really the freedom you have to have an immensely powerful publishing tool at your fingertips. Um, which, and the other important thing is that you can own, you can actually own it. And the next section, we're going to start looking at platforms and the, the nuances there, because when I say you can own, it depends which platform you actually use to do that. So blogging platforms, pros and cons of the various options that you might come across. Um, some of the ones that we're going to go through, you'll, you might be well familiar with, or you'll have been reading blogs on those platforms, but you might not have drilled down into the sort of nitty gritty about what, what differentiates some of these platforms. Okay, so here's a sort of smattering of some of the most popular. Some have been around quite a long time. And I've loosely categorized them into what I call walled garden um, or self-hosted. Self um, and I'll explain why. But let's, let's go through the ones that are up here, um, starting, I think, on the, yeah, the top right with TypePad. Um, so TypePad is, a, is um, a very old blogging platform. It's, it's one of the, the earliest to be out there. I, I think very few people probably start new blogs on TypePad, but you may well come across some some blogs that still have the sort of dot type pad um, sort of suffix at the end of them showing that they're actually on that platform. Um, it's a free platform so it was very popular in the early days and right next to it you've got the Blogger logo. Blogger is owned by Google and that's still quite a, a popular platform um, and it's had its advantages because once you're in the sort of Google ecosystem um, then, you know, it, everything is integrated. So it's much easier if you're a sort of, uh, you know, a Google Analytics and Gmail sort of person. If you've got Blogger there as well, then you, you're kept within the sort of Google, Google bubble, so to speak. And it's another free platform. Um, Weebly is a commercial platform, um, which I'm not that keen on myself. Um, and right next to it is Wix, which is another one that's still very, very popular. Um, very frequently when I'm on various Facebook groups, because I'm on um, some sort of Facebook groups for entrepreneurs and startups, a lot of people frequently post, you know, should I be on Wix? Should I start my new little business website on Wix? Because it seems very easy to do that. Um, everything is, is bundled together. You don't have to worry about your own hosting. You don't have to worry too much about the technology. It's a sort of drag and drop interface to be able to create your pages and your blog posts. So it seems a very easy platform to be on and it, it comes in at what seems to be quite a low price, but it has its hiccups as well. I mean, um, we'll go into a sort of drill down on the pros and cons of some of those um, commercial plug and play almost uh, platforms versus ones that you have to do a little bit more yourself. Uh, moving on, on the top left, we have wordpress.org. Um, now, WordPress.org is um, free open source, which means you can just download it. Um, but often people who don't understand this, they, they download WordPress and they say, well, you know, how do I then get it up on up on the web? You know, it's, it's here as a sort of load of files and they, they don't know what to do because WordPress.org requires you to buy your own hosting, requires you to upload WordPress to that host and understand things like root folders and perhaps also attach a theme on top, although you can easily use some of the WordPress free themes on it. So you're not obliged to do that. They come each year with a new theme like 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, and so on. So each year you get a basic free theme and a, and a, a small choice of other free themes. So WordPress.org is, is wonderful, but you have to know what you're doing a bit. There's also WordPress.com. Um, now WordPress.com, is um, hosted by WordPress. So again, it's a bit like the walled garden ones where it's all bundled on one platform and you don't really have to do any work behind the scenes and worry about the back end of the site. You can concentrate on the content. So WordPress.com has been, with previous student groups, it's been a very, quite a popular route to getting a blog up because you don't have to pay for anything. In theory, it is totally free as well, like the, the bloggers of this world. Tumblr is one that you're probably very familiar with. Um, I don't know if it's quite as popular as it used to be, but you will still find a lot of blogs on Tumblr. The difference between um, Tumblr and also the next one down with the sort of purpley dark background there, moving, thinking forward, move thinking forward, um, that's Medium. And what Tumblr and Medium do, they're free platforms. Um, there are difference between them, but basically free platforms. But what they do is basically 
create a sort of community of blogs. So when you put a blog, put a blog up on Tumblr or you put it up on Medium, you almost become part of this community. So in theory, your blog will be under a certain category there. And if it's getting a lot of traction, then Medium and Tumblr might, might promote it. So you, it's almost like a sort of giant magazine. And so when you sign up for things, especially sign up for Medium, you'll be asked to check box categories that you're interested in, a bit like when you sign up for, for Twitter and these things. So then if you go into the Medium homepage, it will have rendered up, you know, blogs that are sort of like, um, what's the one, um, sort of most noticed and most uh, most recent and most noticed or whatever the word is they use on um, iTunes um, and most popular. So they will serve you up types of content. So it differs a bit from the Wixes and the WordPresses because there you're, you're not really in this community of blogs. You're, you're just putting out your, your own individual blog. And I'll talk about a bit more about that in a minute. Okay, so um, I've done a kind of a checklist really of the pros and cons and I've taken WordPress.org because it is the one that is totally open source and totally free. Um, you just have to know a little bit um, about the back end of things to be able to use it in the right way versus all of these walled garden ones where they, a, company has, a company has put them out there and you have to pay a sort of monthly subscription for them. So let's just run, around, run down WordPress.org first. Um, as I said, it's open source, which means that basically the coding is put together by a worldwide developer community. And the wonder of this is that if you did start a, a site on WordPress.org and you wanted to extend it, there are sort of limitless possibilities. For a start, you've got absolutely masses of themes to choose from. Now, the actual free themes are somewhat limited, but then you can go on um, things like Envato Marketplace or Theme Forest, and you can buy for about uh, anywhere between about sort of 10 and 100 bucks, depending on how complex the theme you want. You can buy a theme to bolt on to that basic coding, the WordPress the WordPress core, then you bolt on the theme. So you've got so much more creative freedom out there. And so once you have your theme, you can also bolt on little things called plugins, which can extend the functionality. For instance, um, I put up a site recently, which is for a conference. It's sort of a one-off event site. So I bought a conference theme, which has wonderful interfaces, things like speakers and the speakers bios, which you wouldn't get in a sort of basic WordPress um, site. But this theme is developed specially for conference conferences. So the developers knew exactly the little bits that conference people want. Um, but I found that I actually needed to have a certain form on there for people to sort of register for the, cons the conference. Now that didn't come bundled with the theme. So I hunted around and I found a, what they called WordPress plugin, which was actually free. Um, and I bolted that onto the site. So now I have the correct form and people can check box various options for meals and whether they want to go to cultural tours. And um, it can link through to a payment gateway as well. So you can see that if you're on WordPress, really the, the world, is, um, world is limitless in what you can do. Um, you're, you're not stuck by some proprietary company determining set piece themes or set piece looks or charging you a lot extra if you want something extra on top. Some of those plugins are premium plugins so that if you wanted extra special functionality or support from the plugin developer, you might have to, to buy them. And generally plugins are, are quite cheap. I think the most I've paid is about $80, $80 but that was a sort of lifetime access anyway. So WordPress.org gives you immense flexibility. You can create um, a site as large as you want. Some of the proprietary ones like Wix and Weebly and Squarespace will charge you a certain subscription price on a per month up to a limited number of pages, let's say 20 pages. And then after that limit, they might want to charge you more. Now with WordPress, you can just add on as many pages as you want. And the only limitation is your hosting company might say, you've got a lot of pages, you're getting a lot of traffic, a lot of hits, and that takes some time, believe me. Um, we might be, you might need to upgrade your hosting so that if, if you're on a shared hosting package, you might need to buy, let's say, sort of more of the, more of the space, more of the hosting, so your site can grow. But that's about the only limit. Um, so you have a choice of host. You can put your site wherever you want, whereas with the proprietary ones, you are stuck on their, their hosting and you have to rely entirely on them. You can't swap around and say, well, I've started my Wix uh, website, but I'd really like to move it to a different host because I find Wix is very, very slow. And, and that is actually very often one of the complaints about some of these proprietary ones because you're using shared hosting with a load of other people, um, the server might not be in the right part of the world for you or the right part of the world where your customers want to come into your site. 
So you might find you've got very slow download times, very slow times, very slow upload times. Um, whereas with WordPress, you can choose your own host. So if you want to put it on, um, you know, Bluehost, or you want to put it on SiteGround, or you want to stick it in the States or in the Netherlands, wherever, you, you have that choice to do that. Um, the other thing is, um, which I think is quite interesting, Confrows, and if you go onto the bottom um, set of points there, the dedicated support. Now, a lot of people feel overwhelmed by using WordPress because you can feel like you're out there on your own, despite having a worldwide development community, you might have to Google around to find out how to do something or, or pay somebody extra to help you do it if you're not terribly tech savvy. Whereas with these um, proprietary ones, the advantage is for sort of new entrants into setting up a website, creating a blog, um, you have pretty good support generally, not on all of them, but you can have good support and it's dedicated support. So you pay your monthly subscription um, to Wix, Weebly and Squarespace and, and their support desk is open for you all the time. So you have pretty good support and people who really know those packages. Whereas WordPress, you might have to fish around a lot. Sometimes I've taken three days Googling to try and find an answer to how to do something in the code or how to do something on the site. So you have to be prepared to, to learn a little bit more. There's a little bit more of a learning curve, but maybe with the WordPresses of this world, that the, the advantages are greater in the end. It really depends on the strategy for your site. Um, with the proprietary ones, they generally have drag and drop editors, so it's very simple to design a site how you want. You just go in the back end and you're literally just sort of grabbing and dropping at a chunk blocks, which will say, you know, add photograph and have text to it, or you want a button or whatever. Um, it's much, much easier. You don't really need to have that sort of design skill behind it. Um, and very often they come with things bolted on, extra things like analytics built in. So um, you'll find on the dashboard when you go into your blogger site, you'll find that you have the analytics there within the dashboard the moment you enter the site. Whereas with things like WordPress, you might need to bolt on Google Analytics separately and, and set up all that sort of Google ecosphere as well. So it's I think it's horses for courses really on these two. Um, and it very much depends on, on what you want to do with the strategy for your site. Okay, um, I've taken these two now just quickly to go through WordPress.org and Medium, um, really to compare the sort of out there by yourself as a blog rather than being part of a mag magazine sort of ecosystem. So some of the things we're going over again, it's open source. WordPress does have its content management system, um, not the drag and drop type, but it will, you know, it, it, it gives you a sort of routine of how to put up your content. So you don't necessarily always, unless you're doing something you know, like I said, I wanted to extend the functionality of a site. You don't necessarily need to touch the back end. Medium, it's as simple as literally opening a Word file. You literally go in and you start writing and you just insert. So if you can use Microsoft Word, you can you can use Medium. It's really not that very difficult to, to put up a Medium blog post. Um, so yeah, so Medium, I think, is if um, part of your assignments here at university are starting a blog, I think um, you're going to be looking at WordPress perhaps the WordPress.com version, which is the free and they host it, but with limited functionality, or Medium as probably the key two choices of what you're going to be using to, um, to put up your blog. So we've looked at a lot of platforms. So perhaps because there are so many and new ones coming out all the time, all those new proprietary ones, the Squarespaces of this world, which have become quite popular in the last few years because of their ease of use. Um, you might think, well, this is a non question because, um, you know, people are still using blogs, therefore people are finding a, it's, it's worthwhile creating a platform and charging people for it. Well, a few years back, there was this thing about, oh, blogging is dead, nobody wants to blog anymore. You know, that's when Facebook really came to the fore because it was a much easier way to get your message out there. You didn't have to worry about it. technology. Um, you could just spout off every day and it was a much easier thing to do. So a few years back, there was this question thrown out that nobody's gonna be blogging anymore and it's, it's completely pointless and it's dead. Well, actually, as we can see, just from the fact that there are so many platforms that still exist as options for us to put our blogs on, that, that clearly the blog isn't dead. In fact, it's uh, thriving and, and stronger than ever before. Um, this is something if you go onto wordpress.com, you can find uh, this wonderful world map. Um, and if I was on uh, a live feed at the moment, you'd see all these sort of lights um, pinging on and off the whole time. I think this screen grab I did quite early in the morning. So certain parts of the world aren't awake and obviously certain parts of the world aren't as, um, 
you know, cabled up and uh, like most of Africa is completely in the dark as is South America. So it's a just time zone thing, but also um, a, a development thing as well, clearly. Um, but what you'll see is the incredible number of blog posts because you have posts, um, this is on the wordpress.com platform. So this is the one that they can monitor because they own the hosting. They, they have people's sites um, hosting them for free. Um, so they can monitor these. This doesn't include all of the ones that people like myself put up using wordpress.org and buying my own hosting. So if you were to include that, it would be completely peppered, I think, um, with, with lights flashing. So posts were flashing as they came up. Um, the green lights were comments that were, were being posted up. It was really quite um, quite interesting to see how, how popular and how busy blogging is still. So by, by no means dead. So just a few statistics, because these things are, are always quite impressive. Um, you can look through these at leisure. 50,000 WordPress.com sites are being launched daily. Now, this is probably from about a year ago, but it just gives you a sense that there's no shortage of, of people wanting to start a blog, whether it's a family one on their holiday, about their hobby, um, starting out on like drone filming, a tutorial type of blog a passion blog, a corporate blog, all sorts of things are going up. Um, conversely, even if you look at these figures, there are lots of blogs that have kind of died a death on the internet. So they went up and they're there static. And I'm, I'm guilty of this too. I have a, a food blog up, which I haven't posted on for at least about two years. And another blog I haven't posted on for about a year because, you know, people move on through blogs. They don't always um, remain with the blog they first started off on and things change or their interests change or, you know, they don't make any money from it. And as I said, it's quite a lot of hard work sometimes blogging in cyberspace out there every evening, um, you know, no comments and, and no monetary rewards. So you've, you've got to have a, a strategy, which we'll look at in the last the last part of the deck, actually, on why people want to blog. But um, yeah, so it's an impressive amount of activity still going on and the number of files that go out there. I mean, I just did a, a couple of websites about a year ago for a, a friend in Austria who launched two new sites and, and two blogs. She is struggling a little bit to keep up evenly on both of them, but but you know, it, it's for her business and she has a reason for doing it. So there's no shortage of people launching. Okay, so how many people are reading? Um, I think that you see Google, um, Google search, <coughs> Google and they, they loves, loves blogs generally because blogs are updated frequently, as we found out at the beginning, or they should be. Um, so the more you update the content, the, the, the more fresh content you have, in, have going out on a site, uh, the more Google search engines, their bots and crawlers will, will, will find that and go, oh, this is interesting. This is an active blog. This is an active place. There are leads back into it. People are commenting. There's activity going on here. And so it will boost you up the rankings for the search terms that we've defined you want your blog to be found for. So clearly, um, when you're Googling something to find out something, and I do this practically every day, how to do a certain thing on Photoshop or, you know, how to check a fact somewhere, very often, um, particularly in the how-to tutorial side, it'll be a blog post on somebody's blog that comes up with how to create a mood board or how to do a certain Photoshop effect. Um, I might just beam in and out only to use that particular tutorial, but I've hit their website because they put up very useful content. So a lot of what we find um, coming up in those Google research search results will be actually posts on people's blogs rather than static websites. So that's hence the, the growth in the graph there. So who runs blogs and kind of why do they run blogs? Um, and you know, this is something I've asked myself a lot, especially on those blogs that are languishing out there. It comes a point where you have, you, I mean, you really need to start off with why am I going to run a blog, not be blogging for a while and then think, am I still going to do it? So strategy, even in, if, if you're running a personal blog is, is always useful to think through first, but many of us are guilty of not actually doing the strategy first. Um, well, who runs them in the bigger, wider world? Well, you might not realize this, but all of these big names um, are actually using WordPress, wordpress.org, self-hosting their own sites slash blogs because a portion of their site may or may not be a blog. So with wordpress.org, you can put up what to all intents and purposes looks like a normal site and you can activate or not that chronological diary part um, depending on your aims. I mean, if you, for instance, the local company that I work for, their, their, their site, their their um, company site runs on wordpress.org and the blog part they use for their news. So that's why they're using the chronological order. It's sort of the corporate news goes out. 
But all of these big guys are on WordPress.org. So clearly WordPress is um, very flexible. None of these guys look the same if you go into their sites, all using them for different reasons um, and all using different aspects of the technology that on the WordPress.org platform. Um, if you move down, this is the sort of average corporate blog. The one on the right is the, I cropped it a bit, but that's the company they work for locally. Um, so they have medical news going out. So that's what they use the blog part for. The rest of it, as you can see, is about and services um, and the sectors they work in and things like that. The New Yorker, which is a magazine, uh, MTV News, PlayStation, MS, uh, MS, I think this is the local MS site. Um, using the blog for news as well and talking about their offers and things like that. So as you can see, it's the big boys and then all sorts of other corporates. Then we get down to the, the blogs that most of us tend to run, this personal slash business type of blog. Um, so some of these are international names, like the lady there on the sort of top left, Marie Folio, you may have come across her, B-School, she started this sort of alternative to an official MBA. I think she was a gym instructor once or something like that. And she became sort of well known on, on, on social media. She had her blog going, a sort of motivational, inspirational um, entrepreneurship style blog. And she's been very, very successful. So she grew from a blog into a little in, into a business and now into a big business, actually. Uh, but but ultimately, it's it's still, you know, the Marie show. Um, the other one on the, the left there, pro blogger. Um, that's uh, Darren Rose, which is uh, R-O-W-S-E. He's a photographer um, and got more and more into blogging technology. And he actually set up something called Pro Blogger. So if you're interested in learning practically anything about blogging and for you Google something, in fact, Pro Blogger blog posts will, will come up a lot because Darren has been, has been blogging for about 15 years, I think, blogging on blogging. And platforms and also running his uh, his photographic tutorials blog which he swears actually makes him more money than the pro blogger site but he's a very very big name in the blogosphere um, then on the far right we've got a local blog this is run by Leslie Vella who's at the tourism authority um, Leslie does a really lovely personal photo blog of Malta with really wonderful write-ups and amazing photography and he's kept it very much as a personal blog he gets a phenomenal amount of comments Actually, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets hit more than many of the official tourism uh, uh, site um, blog posts or pages, actually, because he does a really nice personal view of Malta. And the other two are, again, there's one in the cookery field there at the bottom, a lady who lives in France, and the one in the middle there, I think she's Danish and Danish-American, and runs a fashion fashion blog. Um, and they kind of have built up their cult followings, actually, but they are all actually what's interesting, apart from Leslie, they are all actually monetizing their blogs in different ways. And we'll be looking at how you can do that later on. Okay, then comes the group slash magazine blog, which is what I mentioned earlier when I ran Mortar Inside Out. We had about 80 people contributing at any one time. So clearly there's, there's more than just an individual behind it. Um, this is the HuffPost, uh, the HuffPost social sort of charitable uh, philanthropic site, not its main news site. It has a dedicated one for looking at philanthropic and charitable works. Um, and BirdLife, they're another local example of a charity in the middle. And these are run by multiple people. So many people will be chipping in, almost like a sort of news desk, uh, really. Okay, this is one that my brother-in-law happens to run, Global Disability Watch, which is uh, a, a centre looking at uh, um, sort of disability issues and development issues across the world. So he has a sort of news style site. Um, which is, is it's sort of new style philanthropic. Again, it's run by multiple people. Um, so it's more of a magazine. He has people across the world who are picking up on issues or abuse of disability rights and, um, and, and sort of broadcasting them. So it's a, it has a sort of campaigning aspect to it as well. And he runs the blog really to do um, the news side of things. So the rest of it along the top will be specific reports he's putting out, like Field Pass and Policy Watch and things like that, and humanitarian. But the, the generally, the blog is the latest, uh, the latest news coming up. So as you can see, the blog part actually can be very prominent or very behind the scenes on many of these sites. So if you're that individual fashion blogger, you're probably running your blog posts streaming down the home page automatically in very much that chronological typical diary format with your photograph of you wearing whatever the latest fashion is but these type of sites are running the blog just for the news portion and they have a whole lot of other stuff going on so these will you know the blog won't be so visible and upfront and think oh this is just a site but but it's there it's being run as latest news 
um, what a diary, um, journal, all sorts of names people give to the blog side of the actual site. This is one I did for my um, friend there in Austria, which I handed over to her a year ago. It's in German. She's some sort of um, coach, sort of lifestyle and, I don't know, Feng Shui coach. So this is run on wordpress.org and we had a theme and I customized it for her. So you won't actually see that news part of the blog sort of leaping out at the homepage. In fact, I think um, we, we added it on later when she actually built up a body of uh, blog posts. She actually has added that to the homepage now. But basically those little pictures um, depict uh, pages within of her service pages. So at this point, she didn't have the blog running on the homepage either. So before we go on to this next section, just to recap, um, there are different styles of blogs. There are the group, the individual, the magazine. Um, and as I said before, ideally, they all have some strategy behind them rather than, you know, just popped out of the woodwork. Because as I said, it's very difficult to sustain running a blog unless you really know why you're running a blog. So we'll just pause there before we go on to the next section. So why run a blog? Well, we've, we've touched on some aspects of this already. You might have a passion, burning passion, or you might be an expert in something, you want to share your knowledge, you, you might be a small business or even some of the larger ones and you want to, to help your customers, gain traction with them. There are all, all sorts of reasons why you might want to run a blog that have um, completely diverged from the sort of original blogs that started in the early 90s, which were very much, oh, great fun, I can have an online diary as opposed to writing it on paper. Um, so let's just recap on some of the sort of main tenets of why run a blog before we get into the specifics. Well, as I said earlier, it's very much your human face to the world. Um, and like it or not these days, um, and it comes a little harder to people of my generation maybe, to actually get yourself out there and uh, not quite wear your heart on your sleeve, but to actually talk about yourself, um, not, not just the interest or passion, but actually to put some of yourself into it. Uh, you know, we didn't grow up with that, um, with, with ourselves being sort of, all of us being broadcasters, you know, watch the TV screen and it belched stuff out to us. Um, so it's something we have to get our head around. But ultimately, if you are going to be blogging, as if you're going to be doing lots of sort of Instagram live stories and, you know, become a YouTuber, you know, you're going to be out there more these days than we ever were before. So a blog um, in a positive sense, though, is your human face to the world. So whether you're a charity or a small business or you're starting your small business, maybe you're keen on like drones, for instance, and you want to put out some tutorials on how people can use drones because you want to make some online courses later, perhaps about drone filming. Um, and people have actually started quite good businesses from, from teaching people about uh, drone filming. You know, you have to actually get out there, not necessarily always stand with Behind, you know, stand in front of the camera or even be in the, down the bottom of the screen like me, but you have to be more personable about what you're doing. So it can help almost any entity to have a blog, um, to have that slightly more informal, um, that informal face to the world. Um, the one thing that happens when people go into looking at blogs, they, they hunt around very quickly. We all know that we have very small um, attention span, very short attention spans these days. So it helps when people go into your blog that they can suss out what it is about quite quickly. Um, it's not to say that you can't have um, a very serendipitous um, blog where one day you're talking about one thing and the next the next post you're talking about something completely different. I mean, I, I like that serendipity and I think in many ways, um, with the sort of social media and online world we have today, we, we live in our own bubble. So we only get served up what the algorithms know we've already searched for or what we have preferences for. So it's reflected back to us. So it, it's nice that some people are perhaps still blogging and they're being very um, ad hoc with their subject matters and they can be passionate about many things. So I'm not saying you can't run a blog on many different subject matters, but if you have a strategy behind it and a definitive goals about what you want to do with your blog, particularly if you're a small business or a company or you want to make, monetize your blog, it often helps to have a very clear, recognizable, instant recognizable face and voice and subject matter. Um, and, and the why is if you have all those consistent nuts and bolts together, be it in the visual clues um, or the audio clues or any other way people go in and they know what they're finding, then it really helps if you want to keep a consistent audience. Those people come back to you and they come back for more information um, on drone filming or, or whatever it is. Um, and when I, I did a, um, a lecture run a bit like this for some charities a little while back, 
And, um, you know, because so many of the charities locally, their blogs were all over the place, uh, very hit and miss, very inconsistent. They were putting out news on them, but they weren't really attracting people to engage with them in any way, uh, shape or form through their blogs. So I said, if you could just get a little bit more strategic about why you're blogging, um, diversify the subject matter that's going in there. So it's not always a, a me, me, me type of blog, but it's also a, a community building type of post. It would be easier to attract people to, you know, come and help you on beach cleanups or you know bird life things and events and days and to attract partners sponsors and other brands to come and help you um, if they know what they're dealing with then it's a kind of win-win for everybody so if you can get your blog honed into a consistent way shape and form then it's easier to present to the world because we're all very uh, we all have very short attention spans these days and we can't be bothered to suss something out um, very quickly for instance somebody yesterday posted up on one of the groups I belong to, she, she's making the skincare and she has this skincare brand and she outsourced her Instagram uh, account for somebody else, a sort of agency to run. And she said, I'm not too sure about what they're doing. Can you just go in quickly and, and see what you think of my Instagram feed? So several of us went in and had a look and it was really all over the place, which is surprising since she was actually paying an agency to run this account. So most of us came back with the same thing. We, we didn't know whether she was selling skincare or whether she was selling good or health food drinks. Um, it was all very salesy. Practically every post had her product in it, which was very off-putting because we don't really want to be sold to in that kind of hard sell way, uh, way on social media. So that's just a parallel to blogging. You, you've got to get the right feel um, and, and get the right interaction, vary those posts, not be too pushy, but, but also be engaging and have consistency, but not consistency in a salesy way, consistency of voice, meaning and message. Okay, so many people have asked me, and this comes up in the live lectures, well, you know, I still don't really see why I should be blogging when we do have Facebook out there. You know, I mean, quite frankly, I can use that. I don't have to worry about anything to do with it. Somebody else is hosting it, blah, blah, blah. Well, as we know, a lot has moved on in the Facebook world, especially in the last year, you know, month or two. Um, and we've become, we become very much more aware in the last year, I think, than ever before, that Facebook owns you. And it owns every single cough and spit of your data. And for somebody who started at the beginning in the trenches of putting my own blog out there, I really do like to feel in control. I really want to know that I own things. And it gets me very nervous when I'm relying on proprietary platforms, free or paid, that I don't really have any control about over. So there are, you know, ways and means. Um, there, are, there are reasons why Facebook is, as I said, not enough, for instance. So I really feel you need to, if you're doing anything long-term and sustainable, not just a few posts for, um, you know, ad hoc posts here and there, you want to get something out of your blog, I really do feel you need to own it, which is why you need to look specifically at those platforms we mentioned earlier to see which one is the best fit for your strategy. How much time do you have? How much time do you have to understand the technology? How comfortable you do you feel about, the, how much do you know and how comfortable do you feel about the company? owning um, your blog if you're putting it up on one of the proprietary ones or you're sticking your posts up on Facebook, for instance, you know, how much you, how much control do you have? And is that important to you? So you've got to really ask yourself those questions. Um, microblogging is quick hit only. It's not to say that Twitter isn't there forever and it doesn't get deleted or your Facebook um, entry won't come up at some point. But I, I really do feel that when I go onto Facebook groups, I'm only looking at the most frequent posts that have come up, you know, the most recent ones. I'm, I'm rarely ever using the search to find something in a group and the admins are always going, that has come up before, you know, search it, but, but we don't because we're time poor. So basically I feel we only see what we see of the day. Whereas if you've got your blog out that you own and your posts are there as legacy content, and I know this from Mortar Inside Out, we get an incredible amount of traffic and I'm not even posting at the moment. And we get an incredible amount of traffic on blog posts I wrote a very long time ago. Um, because they're there, they're anchored in search, and the more they get, get hit over time, uh, the more Google likes them. So actually it becomes a sort of weightier piece of content, but I really don't get that feeling from the content that I might put up on Facebook. And it is very much a quick response to somebody's question. I don't get the same, uh, the, the same gravitas and feeling of legacy. Um, so owning your own content is, for me, very important. And I think it's something you just need to be aware of and you need to think about if you do start a blogging career or you are looking at blogging or writing essays about blogging in, in, uh, in, in the course you're doing at the moment. Um, as I said, if, if you have your blog and you own it and you've got valuable, worthy, intelligent legacy content, 
that consistently gets hit, you will go up the rankings. So that's very important. Um, and also the other thing that's very important about blogging as opposed to just whacking it up on Facebook. Now, yes, Facebook has incredible depth of analytics. You can go in and see who is interacting. But I actually find that the Google Analytics associated with a blog are far more powerful because I'm not going through that middleman called Facebook. It's coming directly to me and I can engage directly with those people. I can know about them. Whereas Facebook is, is taking my data to use how it wants to use. Whereas if I'm just looking at my Google Analytics on my site and I can see exactly what content's getting hit and why, I can tailor posts to do more of the same or to improve on what I did or do an update on something I did a couple of years back that has been really, really, really popular posts. So the, the depth and breadth of analytics you can get it's really quite phenomenal and it helps you know your audience to be able to tailor things better to them. Um, the other thing that you can do via blogging is, and this is still a holy grail, a lot of people say that um, email is passé, email marketing, you know, it's, it's had its day, but it is probably the most powerful type of marketing you can do. If you can build an email list and, and there's the rub of it, if you can't build the list it's very difficult. So. There's this sort of uh, cycle. You put out your blog posts so you can get your site found and get more traffic back to it. And once that traffic hits, like I said, I go on some blogs just to find out one technical thing about um, how to do something in Photoshop and leave. Now, very often, you know, when you enter a blog, um, a little pop-up will come up or a relatively fairly obvious uh, su subscribe to my e-news, which you may or may not do because it's not particularly interesting just to subscribe to somebody's e-news. So people have to find other ways of trying to engage people and getting them to actually subscribe because when they are on your email list, you have their email. You have a direct interface with that person. You can pop into their inbox. And that is extremely powerful because if they have bothered to subscribe, there's probably a reason why they were interested in what you had to say. So they're less likely to delete you from your inbox. And it's that direct intercession. Every morning you put on mail, you scout down things. Um, and, and I do click on the ones that I generally wanted to subscribe to. So I know it's a very powerful engagement tool. So the more you can build your list, then when it comes, maybe you want to sell them an online course or you want to you want to promote some event that you're doing, you have a direct contact with them. They're not going to get lost in the sort of all the noise online. So um, for companies these days, building a subscriber list is hugely important. Whether you're that lone bloggers, fashion blogger, startup, and you want to develop um, a little bit of side income from that, or you're the kind of companies that I'm working for here, that email list and having that direct customer engagement is hugely important. Um, and with Facebook, you don't. You can go through direct message, but you do not have that, that direct um, interaction with them in, in the way you think you do, but you don't really. Okay, so we all know this. If you're going to pay, you know, if you pay, you get seen. If you don't pay, you're not likely to get seen. And that's the way it's gone. You don't, you don't get a free lunch for nothing. Um, and it's the same whether it's on Instagram or it's on Facebook. And this is the thing, you know, these are platforms that we use and we get rather on our high horse when things get taken away from us or revelations come about out about these platforms. But remember, you know, we're not paying for them. So they can use us how they want. And, and that's, you know, bit of a private person. I do like to own my own data and own my own stuff. So this is one of the latest uh, Facebook. This is a, a few months back, I think last, last autumn, um, when they started gerrymandering around with the organic reach. And we all know, you know, a friend of mine has something like 160,000 people on her Facebook group, follow, supposedly following her. But of course, they're not you know, only a few, a handful of those are actually going to see what she's posting every day, unless you pay. So that's the way it goes, which if you own your own blog, you're in total control of how much promoting or not that you do. Um, going back to my brother-in-law, there was, an, and his um, disability global watch um, site, He's, he spends quite a lot of time in South America and when he's there, he finds it obviously easier to put up his sort of reports on Facebook. That's a nice direct um, way of keeping quickly in contact. Um, and I said to him once, you really need to bring that content home, back to your home and actually write proper posts from that. So it's not sort of dispersed in, in Facebook sort of down the feed and nobody's going to find it again. But it actually can be there as legacy content on your site, helping drive traffic, helping build up your own home, um, helping people interact directly with you so you know who your potential sponsors or partners can be, whereas they do tend to get lost on Facebook. So. Um, it's fine if you want to use Facebook to do those daily updates from somewhere. It's a wonderful way to keep in contact. But think of the 
and the information you're putting out and the kind of things you can maybe craft a, a really good blog post from that is going to be legacy, hardworking legacy content back on your site. Okay, and now in the next section, we're going to look at the skills you need to run a blog. Now, I hope so far that I haven't actually frightened you off blogging um, and I can keep some of that excitement going um, because as I said, even though I've been blogging for near on 20 years, I still really enjoy it. Um, okay, I did come from a journalism and a content background, so I do love writing. For me, actually, the audio and the visual parts of blogging are slightly more scarier spaces and I haven't really done any filming and I should have, you know, all that part to it. I do to tend to stick to, to text heavy and photographs. So there are, even for people like myself who've been blogging for 20 years, there's still loads more that I need to stretch and push myself to do. Um, so I'm going to whiz down some of the things that you would, some of the skills that you will need, not all at the same time, not all to the same degree, but that you will need that all go into running a blog, um, whether you're that individual running it or you're running a corporate one. Um, if you're a site, ma a blog manager, for instance, or a site manager, you will be need to engaging. You will need to engage people who can cover off many of these skills. Um, and I know some of you are great wizards with audio visual and feel totally comfortable, you know, mobile filming stuff. And others might be great writers. So we we all have our strengths to play to. But you need to take all of this lot into consideration. So uh, yeah, I sort of wrote down, um, there's probably more that could go on this list. Um, yeah, starting with the writing side, you've got to have that idea for a blog post. You've got to, as I said, if there's consistency and a theme to your blog, it becomes easier because your little antenna are out between writing the blog posts. So supposing you're writing about, I don't know, Photoshop or some latest web tech thing or issues, environmental issues here in Malta, um, whether it's local or international, your little antenna, content antenna are working all the time. So, you know, you're constantly bookmarking things. Go, oh, that'd be really good. I could pick up on that and discuss that in a blog post. So once you've got the strategy and you know the theme of your blog, it becomes much easier to find those content ideas than sort of fishing around um, with a type of blog that does different things every single day. So you're, you're constantly there as a sort of researcher. Um, and then thinking about how that can be honed in with your journalist or your editor or your writer hat on, how that can be honed into a nice readable chunk. Because let's face it, blog posts, they can be very lengthy, particularly the tutorial side of things when you're learning through a sort of Photoshop sequence or you want to know how to do something, then those tend to be quite, can be quite long blog posts. But generally I write between 500 to 800 for a blog, words for a blog post if it's on a, a sort of discursive theme. Um, so your antenna out, you then need to work out how it can actually have a headline, how it can grab people's attention. Um, you know, it's beginning, middle and end, just like writing an essay. You just, you know, generally well-crafted blog post needs to have a bit of thought behind it. Paragraph, paragraph breaks and all of that. Um, then you've got the promotional side. I mean, it's no good just writing it and sticking your blog post up because, you know, the old sort of thing like, you know, write it or publish it and people will come. Well, they, they don't, they don't. Um, so you have to have that social media hat on as well. You have to understand how you can carve up your blog post and, and put it out as little sound bitey bits on your different social media, make an Instagram story of it. Um, always I have, for instance, one of the visuals in a blog post will be pinnable. So it immediately goes onto my Pinterest board and it is surprising how much traffic I get on some of my blogs from Pinterest. Um, Pinterest is basically another search engine, a very visual search engine, and, and no, it isn't all women over 30 who are housewives looking at beauty and cooking. It is a very useful tool, whatever business you're in, because it drives inbound traffic. It, those links on Pinterest, people are searching for, you know, know, how to cook something or how to do something. Up comes your beautiful pin, because you've got to make it really visual, visit visual, and they will click back through to your site and read that blog post. So that's really valuable inbound traffic. So you've got to have your social media marketer hat on as well. How am I going to use these different social media, perhaps not all of them, but the ones I feel comfortable on, like Pinterest and Instagram, for instance, but I really don't understand Twitter, so I'm not going to go down there. Um, choose your social media, work your blog post that you have on your home, carve it up into those sound bites or those visuals that can be out there on your social media, feeding potential phishing for new audiences and traffic to come back to your to your site to gain more traffic on your actual blog as well. So you've got to have a social media hat, your content marketer hat on, SEO, when you write, first write that blog post, you actually have to write it with SEO keywords in mind. Um, you know, here's, you can have a fun title to your blog post, 
But then some of the nuts and bolts on the SEO side, you have the URL, what they call the permalink. So you could call it something like 10 fun ways to, I don't know, do whatever it is. Um, but your permalink could be a much more factual uh, link. It doesn't have to be the same as the title of your blog post. And I'm not going to show you this back end, but if you do run WordPress sites, you'll, you'll probably come across this if you put in a, a, a plugin called Yoast um, SEO, which really helps with helping you define those keywords and how many you've got within your within your blog post. Um, you can't overload it or keyword stuff, but you have to have various semantic varieties of your keywords so that Google has a chance of, its bots have a chance of coming across your blog post, understanding what it's about because it can see in a certain subhead two or three times in the in the post content that you're actually talking about the same thing. You go, ah, oh, this, this post is about that. We'll index it. Um, and then it will start getting found. So you've got to have your SEO hat on. Um, you've got to understand um, a bit about Google Analytics as well, because you want to know when are people hitting it? Why are they hitting it? Where is the traffic coming from that is hitting that blog post? Oh, it's all coming from Pinterest. So I should do more of that. Or it's all these type of people, or it's people in Los Angeles are finding it, or people in Iceland, you know, why is that? So you've got, you've got to look at your audience. So analyze your audience. So you've got to have some Google, basic Google analytics skills or, or data crunching skills. Um, if you're running a multi-author blog, you might have to do blog admin, um, yeah, assigning people sort of admin rights. And then there's the other side of blog admin, which is actually having as like a content schedule, um, having a load of sort of free or paid for stock photography to hand, or you know that on a certain day you're going to go out and shoot some photographs, or there could be flat lay photographs you want to do on your desk. Um, scenery photographs, you need to interview a friend, you've got to have a sort of scheduling set up so that you are running your blog, blog in a fairly regimental way. If it's more than just a sort of dabbled holiday, um, uh, hobby type of blog, if you want to do it with a strategic hat on, then you have to have some administrative skills. You might be an ace photographer and your blog could be primarily a photographic blog um, and that takes organisation too, um, you, you, but even if you aren't a photographer, Blog posts need visuals for you to carve up, to stick onto Instagram, to stick onto um, Pinterest, for instance. And also the visuals within your blog can be SEO tagged as well. So um, ideally you have one or two visuals in the text, which will have those SEO or versions of those SEO keywords on them so that they can get found. So you've, to some extent, you've got to understand how to either take your own photographs or source really good photographs um, and, and how to manipulate them in some basic uh, photo manipulating things, either Photoshop or, or online free tools like, like Canva or PicMonkey. So you're constantly dealing with photographs um, and understanding the visual impact of your blog. You've also got to be a bit of a designer. Um, even if you're using one of those drag and drop type of uh, content management systems, you have to know how to arrange stuff on a page, how it's going to look visually, what would, what would attract you to go, what, what attracts you to going into certain blogs, what attracts you to the way they lay out their page. You know, do some research, have a look at other people's blogs, see what styles they have. They might be limited by the theme and have done very little and just bought a nice theme and they just plug in their content. Other ones might have um, actually developed their own pages. So have a designer's eye as well on your blog. You might attach a podcast and embed your podcast within your blog. I mean, podcasting is a very powerful way to get found. It's, it's something I've thought about doing quite a few times, podcasting, because I'm more a broadcaster probably um, than I am sort of like comfortable standing in front of a camera. So you need a plethora of various audio visual skills, you know, some basic movie editing. Um, and then we move on to the advertising. Uh, yeah, if you want to monetize, um, one of the old school ways to do it when I first started was to have, you know, ads running down the side, which in a theory didn't make so much sense because you're putting your wonderful content out so people hit your site so that then they hit an advert and go off somewhere else to a third party site. And you might get a minuscule weeny percentage of that, you know, click through revenue. So um, I do run Google Ads down the side of Mortar Inside Out and actually they do, you know, they do clock up quite a bit because the site gets so much traffic that people do click on the ads. Um, although I, I personally rarely ever click on ads, Mortar Inside Out does make, you know, a hundred bucks here, a hundred bucks there from us doing nothing and just running ads down the side. But more and more these days, what people um, feel you should do is if you've gone to the effort of creating your own content, 
then you need to leave that content so you make the money directly yourself. Let me give you an example. Somebody has that, let's say that drone filming site, um, and then on the side, um, they start you know, putting together some drone filming tutorials. So on their site, they're gonna be selling their own online course. It can be just a small amount, or it can be put on a third party platform, something like um, Teachable or Thinkific, which can host your online course, for instance. So very much more these days, bloggers become their own little, um, own little sort of revenue engines with their own content. They manipulate it in different ways. Um, they might give away some free templates or they might give away a few premium plugins or premium things as well. Rather than say, I'm doing all this content just to get volumes of traffic, which would be enough for that small percentage of people who come to my site to maybe hit that advert and then I maybe get a little bit of revenue back. So that model has sort of edged out of the window. When I first started blogging, it was very much, which is why I said I was writing a post every day to, to fuel my advertising engine. Now, if I'm gonna do the writing, it's to drive revenue through my own um, thoughts, words, and deeds, rather than relying on some third party advertising to give me a little minuscule bit back. Okay, let's look at um, some of the social media side things. Um, skills and strategy. When I talked about the various skills you need, um, it's very easy that you, you can end up in your blog and also your social media, just, just talking to yourself, actually, uh, which is what I'm doing now, which seems really odd. But if you extrapolate that, if you're putting out your content on your blog, very often people are then doing what I said they should do. You know, they're disseminating um, that blog post in different ways on their various social media. But the problem is, again, they don't have a strategy as to how they're levering that social media. And I'm only going to talk briefly about this because social media strategy is, is a whole different field, but I just want to show you how it can interact. So you've got your blog. In this case, this is um, a local um, charitable entity, sort of philanthropic entry called Fish for Tomorrow, and they promote sustainable fishing and sustainable fish eating. So they go out of their way to hold, host events and promote like local restaurants who are um, providing um, fish fish meals, fish recipes, uh, sorry, fish fish um, menus that come from sustainable fish, uh, sustainable sources. So it's a really worthy cause. And I thought this was really interesting to investigate. But when you go on to some of their social media, they, they're putting out, somebody's a very good photographer, they're putting out really good um, photos, but they're not getting many likes and they're still more, and this was a few months back, and they're really not getting any comments on it either. So again, they need to have a sort of strategy behind why they're doing that. So if you look at some of the people who are actually bothering to click like, and I did do, I went into some of the audiences interacting with their Instagram, and I came across these guys in, in the States, and they're a restaurant that are actually doing exactly the same thing. You know, they're putting out sustainable fish um, menus and they're promoting sustainable fishing. And I thought if somebody at Fish for Tomorrow had actually looked into who was interacting with them, kind of know their audience, they could maybe hook up and do a joint webinar with these guys. They could do some some sort of joint, you know, across, across the pond type of uh, collaboration. It could be quite interesting, exciting to share things, even just internally in their own organizations. So if you're not looking at who's interacting with you, it doesn't really matter what audience you have if you're not doing anything with them. I also looked at some of the people who had um, clicked like on them, and I came across um, very similar entities. This chief scientist for Oceana, another policy advance, uh, advisor from Oceana, then there's this guy in Charpany at the Charpany fish market. I mean, you know, he's just there in Sicily across the water. There could be joint events they can do. There's so much more that you can do if you actually bother to understand. So I think very often we get to a point where we've got a blog, we stick out of stuff on social media because we think we ought to, but we've got absolutely no idea why we're doing that or what we want from them or how to interact with these people. So again, there are many opportunities lost. If you're bothering to do the content, please don't lose the opportunities with them. Okay, so just to recap with this really, um, you know, do be aware of the ecosystem outside your blog. You need to lever it. You can get your blog post doing much more hard work if you chop it up into different bits and you promote it over your social media. Do it on social media that you feel comfortable on and know why you're doing it. Um, define the best platforms of when you should be out on that social media by looking at some of the analytics. 
Um, and, and also bother to engage and talk to these people because, you know, blogging can be a sort of vortex and can feel a very lonely thing to do. So the more you leave of what's out there, the greater you can actually get traffic back to your blog and the whole thing has a sort of, it becomes its own engine. But if you're not bothering to interact, um, you know, you might think, well, my blog's got so few hits, why? Because you're not leaving your social media in an intelligent way to partner up with the hard, hard working content that you put on your blog. Very often at this point, um, people start sort of coming up for breath and gasping and say, oh my God, you know, there's that whole list of skills I, I, I need to have, or at some point I need to have to run my blog. Um, there's this whole weight of not just the content on the blog, but I've also got to disseminate it on the social media and understand why I'm doing that and interact with people. And, and you know, there just aren't enough hours in a day to do that, especially um, some of the people that I I come across on my various Facebook groups um, are very much in this situation. They're small business people, you know, women, got kids at home, doing the school run, doing a day job, trying to start a little business on the side. And, and they, they, you know, it just become, they, they get to the point of overwhelm. Um, and I think this is very common, especially if you're trying to actually run a sort of physical business as well, not just an online business. Doing, doing an online course business is perhaps one of the easier things to do, but if you've got a physical product and you're dealing with all the other stuff associated with that, it's very easy like that lady I mentioned with her Instagram account, she outsourced it, but it was being done badly outsourced. So you, you bring it back in house and it's, it's another chore to do. So very often um, people, especially those who are trying to monetize their blog, can find that they're you know, totally time poor and, and suffer overwhelm. So at this point I say, don't panic. Unlike in my early days of one blog post a day and then having to do all that dissemination every single day, so you're up burning the midnight oil, Focus on that one good blog post a week. And if, it, if at the beginning you can't do one a week, you know, one a month, whatever your routine is, stick to it because the few followers you have to begin with will get used to it always coming in on a Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, which apparently is one of the best times to actually send out an e-newsletter. And I tend to do that to alert people to various other bits of news and say, oh, over on the blog this week, there was this piece, you know, check it out. Um, be consistent and be regular with your blogging, um, whatever time frame that you feel works for you. So one a week's ideal, one every two weeks, absolutely perfect. To begin with, one a month, no problem. Um, as I said, because it has to link in if you're building a list, because you have a strategy behind your blog, your email list, people like to know, um, you know, Sunday night or Tuesday at 10 o'clock, your email is going to come in, alerting them to your update. And don't assume because you have people in your email list that they're actually on your blog. You do need to send out that reminder. I did this on the blog this week. Um, and I would always recommend that you just choose two social platforms to actually hook your blog in, um, blog posts into. Because more than that, to begin with, you're gonna find it overwhelming. Sometimes you go on people's sites and they've got a whole row of social media. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Pinterest, I'm on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Google Plus, I'm on Twitter, you know, it's all there. But if you go into them, sometimes they're barely doing anything on um, three out of those five social platform. So stick to two that you feel really comfortable. And if you're more visual, it might be Instagram um, or it could be Pinterest. Um, if you like Twitter and it is, a, I find it very useful for certain things, although I don't tweet as often, I do use it for research. It's very good on picking up on things. Um, stick to those you're comfortable with and, and be consistent. I think the thing is consistency, whatever the time frame is. So try not to get overwhelmed. Um, but it can, it can be overwhelming, you just have to manage it basically. So as I said, you need to, um, to be able to cope with a blog on um, any sort of frequent and sort of semi-professional way, even if it's about a passion or a hobby, you wanna get into it and be more consistent. You just have to plan strategically, not just post um, any old thing at any old time of day. Um, and understand you have to be strategic because you have to think about how people are gonna find it. So that means everything from the title of the post to the, the search terms that you wanna put in it because you think those are the things people are gonna be searching for, therefore they might find your blog if you include them. You know, everything, every part of a blog post is actually, can be, um, can be strategic. So content, as you probably gathered from now, um, up to this point, is, is the holy grail of blogging. It is what, it's what drives it. Without, without valuable, useful content, and Google has got very picky in recent years about this, 
um, semantic search, um, you know, poorly, writ poorly written, skim scraped content from other people's sites with a little minimum of topping and tailing to pretend that it's unique content. You know, it's sort of plagiarism thing, basically. Um, won't cut ice with Google search. You, you won't get found. In fact, your site might even get downgraded. So genuine, authentic, valuable, well-written, well-structured, strategic, not over keyword stuffed content is the holy grail of getting a blog or any site really these days out there known and, and getting a bit of authority. So as you can see here, um, these are some I picked from the Huff Post um, from that um, social charitable um, site, not the main news one. Really great headlines here. So immediately you're drawn into the headline. So that the start of you know good content, as any news writer will know, is is the headline, and then after that the first paragraph. The first paragraph of the news story, if it's correctly crafted, should actually tell you pretty much everything that you need to know about the news story because we're time poor. Um, the rest of the news story will have quotes and will have backup and have background and a nice closing paragraph if it's well structured. But ultimately, when I went to, uh, to journalism school, the headline and that first paragraph, brief first paragraph, has to, has to say, set out your stall of exactly what's going on. Now with blog post writing, you have a little bit more leeway than that. You can be very much more evocative and personal. It depends what you want to do. But you do have to think in terms of Google likes to know your keyword is in the first line or at least the first paragraph and preferably in your headline or your permalink. Um, so it's, it's, it's evocative and personal. So sometimes I put very um, eye-catching and evocative headlines and I, you know, uh, I then change to being more factual in the, in the first paragraph or vice versa. But you do need to have a sort of structure to your writing. It's not good enough only to have a great headline. You really need to to craft the actual body content very carefully and have enough subheads to break up the text as well because we as human beings we like to scan things and say is this is this really relevant you know hit the blog post is it really relevant to what i want quick scan ah oh, yes there's, it tells me how to do that down there i'll go back and read it so i'm going to give you a few content writing tips actually so consistency and being regular and consistency in terms of tone of voice as well um, so you have to decide how diverse you want to be in each post um, and what your remit on that is, how much you want it all tying together. I mean, some of those individual bloggers that I follow, there's a lady who does a kind of um, lifestyle edit. I think she's based in North London. And there's another woman I follow who's just beautiful blogs, really beautiful writing. Um, another one's based in Provence in France, and she talks about antiques in France and living in Provence. And it, it's it's a lovely lifestyle blog. And so she writes a lot more evocatively and personally, um, but she's consistent. You know, I, I know when I go in, I'm going to get that kind of good read each week. So that's why I bother to go back. If she started posting about some oddball things, um, I might kind of leave and, and not bother to subscribe anymore. So engagement, as we've said, Again, strategic and consistent, you know, don't uh, be where you can't be or don't have time to be. Um, promote it because it can be blogging for quite a few months. Um, let me give an example. Google, for instance, um, will really only start picking up on your blog if you've been blogging regularly, I would say between four to six months um, each, each week doing a decent length blog post with the right keywords with intelligent content. It can take that much time to start seeing the rewards. But once you get them and you remain consistent and you carry on blogging for a year or even a year and a half, there's a whole snowball roller coaster. You will find you, you start coming up in search and you start going up the rankings. So it is slow burn. No one ever said that content was quick burn. And I think there's a fallacy that people put something quickly out on, you know, we're, we're sort of knee jerk reaction writers these days. We think we're going to get found. There is content takes work. You know, it does. Um, if you go into content, you can be paid quite well with some companies as a content, a content writer. Um, but it is slow burn. There are, there are no quick wins. I would just warn you about that. Um, yeah, and also be visible. Um, as I said, it wasn't something that came naturally to me to begin with, but ultimately people do like that about page. If you're going to write one decent page on your, on your site, got your blog post, your about page is one you really need to focus on. Why you're doing it? People are very curious. Why, why have you started this blog? What was your raison d'etre? Um, where do you live? What, what's, what's behind it? What drove you to have this passion about I don't know, drone filming or whatever it was? 
Um, and also video, of course. Um, visuals are hugely important, not just text, which is where I need to get, uh, get going a bit more. Um, there's always new things to learn. So vlogging, if you can accompany blogging with vlogging, not just do the blogging, but also do the blogging, that's really good. Now, this is probably one of the um, slides that is probably the most helpful to you because I'm going to give you 10 ideas about what you can post about. And these ideas more or less fit any single blog, any topic of blogging that you might cover. Okay, so let's go so that you can refer back to these. Okay, so you can share a very personal story, you know, how something came to be. Um, and, um, you know, for instance, in the case of the charities, when I spoke to them, you know, share a case study, sh share something you've actually did, the, the outcome of, of an event, for instance. So it can be a very personal story. Um, and I think that's a really nice one to start with when you're starting blogging, you know, why you're interested in what you're interested in. And if you're a company or a small business, a little case study, you know, people actually want to see something implemented. They want to see sort of the hands-on effect of something, not everything talked about in an abstract way. So that's a really quick and easy one to do. Um, five reasons why you did whatever or five reasons why something is healthy or we, you know, the list type posts. They have been slightly done to death in recent years, but generally every so often, every few posts, you can put one of those up and they still are very popular in terms of search. You know, people are looking for reasons why or how to do this or, you know, why should I start yoga? 10 ways to do this or five reasons to do that. You know, those are, those are always the things we click on when we're kind of um, bored doing what we're doing and we want to sort of wilf off and, and, and have a little browse somewhere else on the net, you know. Five reasons why is lists of things are very useful. And this applies to technical and also quite emotive kind of things. You can always find reasons for. Um, interviews. This is a very easy one to do, um, although it might not seem like it because you've got to set up that interview, but you can do the interview online and record it um, like I'm recording this now. You know, it doesn't have to be going going out there with your phone or, or a microphone. Um, or doing a text-based interview, you know, just, you know, in fact, that's what the local media here do a lot, I've very often received a list of questions and can you answer the questions and by answering the questions I've written their news piece for them. So I do feel a bit shortchanged doing that. I think they should actually bother to interview me. <laughs> but interviews are a nice, quick and easy way to do somebody in your field, somebody who's more of an expert than you are, somebody who's equally as passionate. Um, you know, there's always somebody you can find and it's a nice quick hit, quick hit blog post. Um, infographics, yeah, if you've got a, any design skills, um, and if not, you can go on things like um, Canva or PicMonkey. Canva has some very nice um, infographic templates. So they take a little bit more crafting. They're not quite as simple as you think, because you've got to think of a storyline. For instance, um, you know, why eating saturated fats is bad for you. There's a kind of like timeline, well, if you eat them here, and then by the time you're this age, and, you know, kind of path through something. Um, with an outcome, or you're comparing two things, sometimes in the graphics compare things, or they can be a whole load of facts put up to kind of make us think about something. Um, they take a little bit more time because they, you, you actually have to do the design side and you do actually have a bit of a storyline through them. So although they're visual, they can take time, but they're very, very shareable on social media. So that's the good thing about infographics. You can get a lot of traffic back or you can persuade other people to share them and get those links back to your site. So they do have a very good place in blogging. Uh, yeah, your backstory, you know, the behind the scenes type of things, you know, why you got into it, or why person X got into it. This is another lovely one. Um, it's a nice emotive one to do. It's very personal. It's very human face. It, you know, checks all those boxes. And it's quite easy because you can just sort of sit down and write train of thought about that. You don't have to do too much research or planning. Yeah, similarly, behind the scenes. Um, and this is what I did sometimes with the company, ones that I work for. You know, we've interviewed specific key members of staff about their business. I think there was one that I filmed um, uh, last year, uh, and he's a, a flight doctor, and he works a lot in Africa for the medical services firm. So his backstory, and he's Portuguese, and he's lived in Africa for years, and he had really interesting backstory. So it was a wonderful story of a person on the ground. So like, if you hire our company, these are the type of people you're going to get. Um, so it put a human face to the company, but still in a very professional way. It was a lovely story to do. So behind the scenes are really, really popular and they make a good read or good view. Teach something. Um, this is always a popular one. And if you find the right thing um, that people want to know about, 
you know, five steps to doing something. It's almost like the list one, really. You could break it down into a list style as well. Teach something. It could be something like baking a cake, or it could be you're really ace on a certain Photoshop filter. You know, how to use something. Those are always very popular. Reviews. You don't have to invent the wheel um, every time with content. You can take content that's out there and have an opinion on it. Um, and I find this is a very good one to do, especially if it's something of the moment. Um, so a, a latest release book or film or research paper, something like that. It's very useful to, to add your own layer. Now, I don't want you to just take a whole quote and regurgitate it or a whole excerpt from whatever the original content was. You do need to top and tail it a lot and interweave your own opinion. But it's a very good, a very good one to do when you're sort of devoid of, of totally um, innovative ideas yourself. Um, this one I put in for the charities, um, you know, somebody who we interact with, one of our partners, so it's a bit like the backstory, um, something that can talk, take you behind the scenes in a transparent way. And many of the people that I'm helping in another part of the work that I do are women who are trying to start um, skincare companies and natural organic skincare. So there's quite a lot of um, work they need to do to educate people into the ins and outs of certain cosmetic ingredients versus other. And there's an awful lot of misinformation out there on the internet as well. So the school that I work for very often interview people who are experts in the field, various cosmetic chemists, for instance, or people who are sort of top beauty bloggers to try and um, do a kind of uh, transparency job, to interviewing them to get sort of educational information out there. So that's a very good one. And having a report on an opinion on reports and statistics. So this might actually link with your infographic one. If you've got, you know, somebody's, this is great, you know, British government puts out statistics on X. Now we all know mm, in these days of sort of fake news that a statistic can be interpreted one way or can be interpreted the other ways or completely discredited, which you know, sometimes is very weird. Um, but there's a lot you can do if you have a layer of knowledge to add to those statistics. Um, it's a very nice one. It's a bit, it's a bit like the um, the review one, but it's looking more at some hard fact stuff. So the opinions. So those are sort of ten quick hit ideas of what you can do um, for blog posts. So when you're devoid of waking up in the morning and thinking of anything, you know, try out some of these. They're sort of plug and play ones. Doesn't mean to say you don't have to do the research, but they're very useful quick hit list to be able to you know populate your blog with. Okay, so why does all this type of content work? Well, this drills back to what we said. Um, it's valuable, intelligent, educative, transparent, it's human. Um, some of them can be very compelling to read. Um, the more you do these types of content, the more and the longer your blog is out, you can build yourself up as an authority on something. Um, this is the day of the expert. Um, in fact, I read something the other day which said, the day of the expert has now gone. You know, everybody's an expert on something on the internet. I wouldn't call myself an expert, I'm just somebody who's been in the trenches a long time and can have an opinion on things. Um, but it does build you up as an authority. If you can be consistent and people come back to you because they know that you've got interesting stuff to say about whatever your blog topic is, then it does build you up. And from that, you can lever and do other things. So yeah, it, it, it can get you found. And what you do with your blog, as we said at the beginning, can be all or nothing, depending on the strategy behind it. So let's talk about, um, just recap on why content is so important. This little pie chart is um, showing us that of the factors that Google uses and nobody knows behind the scenes because Google algorithms change all the time in how it deems the validity of one blog or site over another. Um, but generally, a lot of it is really, as it hit here, it was 28% of the on-page factors of your content, on-page, what they call on-page optimization. So on-page is everything you're doing within that blog post to make sense to Google. You know, the keywords and the visuals with their keywords attached on the, the data on the, on the actual photograph you upload, um, the authority you're putting into it, all of that is building up on-page, off-page, content, uh, off-page SEO, is everything you're doing outside, you know, putting your stuff on social media and trying to get those backlinks to your, you know, backlinks to your site, or making sure that your, um, up, your, your hosting is fast enough so that on a technical front your site is speedy enough. Um, you know, all of those things that are extraneous to your actual blog post are off-site. But still Google um, actually factors more, looks more at your on-page optimization than anything else you're going to do. 
So that leads us on to the last part, which is all about your visitors. We've talked about how to get, what content to do to get your traffic, but when you've got your visitors, what exactly do you do with them next? And how can you interact with them? Okay, so there's important visitors who are gonna actually help you gain traction on your, on your blog and get you your legacy content found for ages so you get even more visitors because it comes up in search engine rankings. Yeah, visitors, I mean, we're, we're, blogging, as I said, can be quite lonely, but if you're consistently for year after year sort of putting out content and nobody's actually visiting your site, it is totally disheartening and you're gonna give up. You're gonna be one of those dead blogs on the internet. So yeah, we're doing it for a purpose, uh, not, yeah, you know, to, to grow ourselves as an authority for our own, I don't know, um, for our, yeah, to maybe build businesses and things like this. So you've got to know who's coming and why to make it make or make it sense for you. Okay, so it's kind of toing and froing. Now, some people start blogs and then work out who their visitors are afterwards. Um, but these days, in the era of strategic blogging, rather than what it was at the beginning, you just write something, start blogging on it and hope somebody comes. These days, we're a lot more time poor and a lot more driven. So we like to work out who our customers are, or at least our ideal customer is, the holy grail of the ideal customer, before we even start building that content. Because then we will build the content to try and attract them. A bit like this flower is doing what it needs to do to attract the right sort of bee so that it can procreate and continue being, you know, next generation of flowers. So ideally that's what we're doing with a blog. Who is it that we'd like to attract and why? Where do they hang out? You know, how does my blog, when they finally get to me, having found me through whatever promotional methods and search that I'm gonna, you know, be doing, what does it do for them when they get there? How am I helping them? Now the, the greatest human need is, is to be helped. You know, you're, you're solving a problem for someone. Um, now, it doesn't have to be totally educative. It can be you're solving a problem because you're entertaining them. Entertainment type blogs are actually some of the most difficult to do. So more of them fall into the how to help or, you know, you know, the sort of healthy diet blogs or the vegan food blog or whatever it is, or how to do the drone flying. You know, we're educating in an entertaining way and an inspiring way, but often it's more of an edu educative type of blog that is the easiest one to get people attracted you know, to come and come and interact with you. But you have to know um, how your blog is helping them in whatever way. That's the easiest way to try and think about customers coming. So what, in, what content is gonna attract them most and how do you connect with them online? Well, there are various ways that you can go about um, actually trying to define who your ideal customer is. First of all, you have to try and hang out where they hang out, try and find them. For instance, if you, if you like some of the women in, in this group that I belong to, they, they, they want to come out with this product, but you know, who is actually going to buy it? Because they're going to invest money in marketing and manufacture. They can't just go through all these thousands, you know, burn through 10, 20,000 and then have a product that nobody actually wants to buy. So they have to try and start thinking in terms of that ideal customer and that ideal audience. So the first, one of the best places to, to one of the best things to do is, you know, hang out where they hang out. So have an idea of who this customer is, you know, do a profile of them. Who is it is going to come in? It's going to be a male over 35 to 55, somebody who's got this income block, you know, all those kind of advertising speak demographics. That, that helps to a certain extent. But one of the easiest things to do is search around some Facebook groups in that theme, like drone flying or vegan, vegan uh, diets, for instance. See who's interacting. Go through, you know, join the group, find out um, the kind of questions they're asking, what, what kind of things come up as discussion topics within those groups on Facebook and think, oh, actually, that's a really good one for a post idea. My blog, if, if I can help them solve these type of issues, I've, I've got a blog that can thrive. So start hanging out in various places. You can use Twitter. As I said, Twitter is a great research tool. You, know, you can type in the keywords and see what type of things are pinging up on, on Twitter almost on a daily basis in, in the area that you're interested in. Monitor, find people, partners, collaborators, people to engage with as well. Um, you know, see if you can find people who, whose blogs, um, you know, try and follow 10 blogs or so in your sphere, five to 10, in the area that you're keen on um, occupying as well. What type of things are they doing well? What type of people? Are they getting any interaction or is it all on the social media? Again, what type of questions are these people asking? 
What type of, um, you know, what type of blog post does really well? What gets the most interaction from them? Um, and if you're feeling brave enough, you know, you can approach people and, and offer a guest post. I mean, it's hard to do that these days, but if you've got a little bit of a blog going and you can say, look at my blog, this is what I'm doing. I think my, my guest post would um, be a great compliment. You don't want to compete, but you can compliment what they're actually putting on their blog. But go, well, why not? You know, it saves me doing a blog post for a day. Gets you a bit of back traffic gets you known. Guest posting, um, if you Google guest posting and how to guest post, there are there are lots of, uh, there's a lot of resources online on that and, and it can actually work for you. But you need a few blog posts going first on your own home before you can do that. But the more you interact with people online, hanging out and lurking just to find out what type of things are going on, finding potential partners and collaborators. Instagram is a very good place for testing the water. A lot of people I know start on Instagram page even before they have their blog out, they've just got the Facebook, maybe or a, a, a vague idea of the kind of product they want to do. They start putting out some ideas and the look and feel and tone and voice, and they test things out on Instagram and see what post gets more traction. It's a great place to find potential partners and collaborators as well, and, um, and, and see what type of questions people are asking, what things happen. Uh, once you start, got a few, once you've got a few blog posts under your belt on your blog, you can start looking at your traffic. You know, where is it coming from? Which social media is it coming from? What type of content is rising to the surface? What gets the most hits? Um, you know, you've, it's very difficult to be unique out there these days. But even if your people say, oh, why should I start on vegan food? You know, there are so many people doing that. I'm not going to have a hope in hell of making my voice heard. But the one thing you do have, your blog topic's not unique, but you are unique. And the voice you bring to that blog is going to be your unique take on it. So please don't plagiarize. Have confidence in yourself to be able to get out there and say your own things and put your own spin on something. It is not impossible to do that. You will find your tribe. People will come to you like the beach that flower. They will find you. You do have to do a little bit of work. It's not a question of build it and they will come. You do need to do a bit of digging into the potential audience to, to find out who. But if you put your own, if you have confidence and put your own unique spin, you will you will get there. It's as I said, it's not quick burn, but you, and you do need to have a you do need to work at it. Okay, so the final bit I'm going to go through really is to wrap all this. Um, blogging, blogosphere talk um, up is really your goals. You think, well, why didn't you start with that at the beginning? But I think actually ending with the goals is easy. We've gone through, you know, what is a blog? We've gone through the nuts and bolts of the different platforms and strategic why you might want to be on one versus the other, whether you want to pay or not, do you want to control or not, how much tech ability do you have or not? You know, all of those stepping stones. And then before you launch off, it's true. You know what you have to do now, the type of skills you have to have, the type of content you can put out, and why you're putting it out, why an audience is important. So it's easier to write those goals, having all those things. Because well, I'm really good at doing that and I really like the social media, but I don't like that one. So you can actually hone your goals more clearly when you know maybe what's in front of you rather than coming into blind into it blind because you'd only have to redevelop those goals almost instantly once you start blogging and think, oh, I can't do that. that, that's really not my type of thing. So let's have a quick look at goals. Um, yeah, you need to, before you start blogging in any systematic way, is at least have an idea of the next six months. You know, where would you like to be? What topics would you like to have covered? What type of audience would you like to have gained? Um, what do you want to be doing with your blog? You know, is it just like Leslie's? I'm just really happy, you know, as a person putting out these lovely visuals and text about Malta every week. I don't have any particular goals, just a personal blog. Absolutely fine. But you could be saying, well, I've spent quite a lot of hours doing a lot of tutorials on various drone flying or how to do vegan recipes, um, you know, this sort of thing. You know, I put a lot of educative blogs out there, blog posts out there, and I'd really like to get something back from that because that's my knowledge I'm giving away for free. We do give away for free. And that's the thing about blogging. You give a portion away for free so you can monetize like the premium bit. So maybe that's one of your goals. I'm going to build up this body of posts then I'm going to launch an online course on something, or then I'm going to have an ebook they can download about something, or then I'm going to have a short video on something, you know, that, that's for sale. You can sell things for very few dollars per download, but if you've got the audience, those downloads can add up to a few hundred or even a few thousand, depending on what your topic is. So how do you want to monetize and why? And how are you going to do that? You're going to build this ebook or this video course or online course. You have to have a vague idea of where you're going. 
to realize that mission. And if it's a totally personal blog and you love just sharing your recipes, absolutely fine. But you need to know that because if you don't hone these ideas at the beginning, by the time you get six months down, blog post a week, getting it all out, that's a lot of hours of your life that you've spent on a blog and you can easily feel dissatisfied very quickly if you haven't achieved those goals. I'm not saying you will necessarily achieve your goals, but you need to define them so you're not disappointed immediately. You also need to review as you go along. Like I said, with Mortar Inside Out, we started on the advertising model and then things in blogging changed. And I said, the advertising, it still actually does give us a bit, but it can't be a major income provider. So you have to think of other ways to do it. And it's incredibly difficult with a local blog to do that, um, to actually monetize it. But if you've got an international topic, there may be other ways you can do it. Um, the 80-20 rule is always worth thinking about. Um, despite my saying it's very time consuming to post, so you might think, well, that's the 80% of your time, you know, the content, the research, the putting it together, the cropping the photographs, uh, optimizing the photographs, doing all the analytics, the SEO, you know, the actual post takes 80% of my time. Wrong. You've got to get into a routine where you can actually get those posts out quite relatively quickly, confidently and consistently, but 80% of your time is spent on marketing them. As I said, put it up on your blog, sit back, nobody's going to find it. So the 80% is how do I make that into a good Instagram story? How do I carve up the that eight point list on that list blog post into eight little different um, social media stories I can put out over a week and a half? You know, make it work harder for you. So you've got to do that marketing or, you know, set up your email list and add on a little bit of an ebook. Done a few blog posts. Can the content from those blog posts be a nice, quick opt-in download? So probably coming to my site says, oh, that's a useful freebie. Yeah, I'll sign up and get that. You know, think about how you can use that content, lever it, market it, in other words, in different ways. So that should be, after a little while of blogging, that should be the 80% of your time, marketing what you've already got and getting it out there to lever what you've already done. Um, list building I've just touched on, so I won't go on that again. Okay, so finally, um, my last slide really, a quick tour, and you can review this at leisure because we're here online rather than the live lecture. So you've got a lot more time to look at this one. Various ways you can make money blogging. Um, services side, advertising, as I said, difficult, possible, have it on the side if you want to, affiliate market, marketing, selling and flipping blogs. I mean, I've done quite a few of these, like, yes, I have, I do put up websites for people. Um, I do put, um, that is one of the things I've done. And how did I learn how to actually do all that? Be through blogging. Because yes, put up WordPress. You've got to know how to do all that, wordpress.org. Add on the theme. Oh no, but the theme doesn't do what I want it to do. I've got to go into the code. I've got to look at how to change things. So over time, I just built up a huge knowledge of the back end of sites and then sort of more constructively taught myself how to do the proper coding like PHP and things like that. So yes, I got into actually creating sites and blogs for other people and putting them up for them. And now I get a bit of money also maintaining them because people don't know how to do update plugins or what happens if there's a hack attack or, you know, so there are ways of making money by flipping blogs. Products I mentioned on the last slide, maybe you're gonna put out a course or an ebook or some sort of video or webinar, paid for webinar, um, all sorts of things you can do on the online product side. There's the visual product side as well. Some people have started food blogs and um, done very well. And it's the holy grail of every food blogger to actually still have a physical book out there <laughs> online, although they don't last uh, popular for too long. Getting that book out there kind of anchors you. And from that, depending on what market you're in, you can do um, demo tours or the publishers will you know, take you around different countries to promo your book. It is possible. It's a long slog, but it's possible. Physical books from the information on your, on your blog or online digital goods as well. Services, a um, bit like what I'm doing here, um, consulting, training, speaking, um, you know, all of those things are quite easy to do spin-offs from blogging, again, because they don't involve a physical product, you can, you can actually disseminate these digitally online. So as you can see, there's a lot of possibilities for blogging. So where next? Um, what can you do with this blog? I hope through the course of this lecture, you've got some ideas. Um, that you're inspired and not aghast at the amount of things you might have to do. It's lovely because you can really take a blog and step stone your way through it. You know, it might feel overwhelming because I've packed in quite a lot of the different aspects of blogging, the skills you need, the, the, the ins and outs of content creation. 
but actually it's a wonderful tool to learn from. And it's also a great thing to have on your CV. If I had somebody coming for a job interview and over a period of time they have sustained a blog, I'd go, wow. You know, I'd go and look at the blog before I read all the other things, because I think it's a very important part of you. It will show me more about you, as show me a lot about your skills, because we've seen the number of skills you have to have. I'd be really overwhelmed. So a blog can be a very useful tool. Change as you go along. That's my last word. Always make sure that you're prepared to, to change and evolve, just like this guy here. I hope you've enjoyed it all, and I'm signing off. Bye.